Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. Maker's Compounding Pharmacy makes medications with you in mind. A nationally PCAB accredited pharmacy who take your specific needs into account with every prescription. Let their LDN experts walk with you on the road to wellness. Call 360 757 6677 or visit makerscompounding.com. I'd like to welcome back today my guest, pharmacist Michelle Moser from the Makers Compounding Pharmacy in Washington State. Is that correct, Michelle? Yes, thank you, Linda. Thank you so much for having me again. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to to be able to speak with you again. And yes, we're actually located in Mount Vernon, Washington, which is about 70 miles north of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And not that far from Portland in Oregon either, is it? So... It's easy for you no, to it's a beautiful drive. <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful drive. Really looking forward to seeing you again in just a couple of weeks. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Chicago a few weeks ago, and I was, was... amazed. Um, Dr. Mark Mandel took us on a tour of his pharmacy, and we were both there. And I didn't realize <laughs> all the rules and regulations and everything that goes on in a compounding pharmacy, what you have to do to be compliant and make sure that the patient gets the very best medication they can and that every step has been taken to ensure that, you know, you have done everything as it should be. Could you explain to us, you know, what you have to do in a pharmacy? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um... I think a lot of people have a, a traditional experience with uh, going into a pharmacy. You know, they take their prescription in or they walk up to the counter and say that their prescription has been phoned in by their provider. And that is um, a fairly one-on-one, -on -one, very linear exp um, experience where the pharmacist takes the medication off the shelf, um, counts it, puts a label on it, does all their due diligence with checking for interactions and things like that, which we do here in a compounding pharmacy as well. However, we start with the bulk ingredients, the active ingredients, the inactive ingredients, the um, dry capsules, and then a wide variety of machines um, and equipment that we use to put all of these pieces together. So there's a lot more activity. Um, it takes a lot of time as well. Um, we can make um, about 300 capsules at a time in a very specialized machine, but that can still take upwards of 40 minutes. But what's really important is that it starts even a few steps before that in that um, we are very specific about where we actually source our chemicals from, whether they're active ingredients or inactive ingredients. It's very important. Um, we only source from FDA-approved manufacturers. Um, with each active and inactive ingredient, there is a document called a Certificate of Analysis, and that document explains the product that is right there in front of us with that lot number and that expiration date. And truly, how pure is that powder? How, how much water is actually in it? Are there any other um, chemicals that we need to really take into account as well? So do we actually need to make some adjustments on how much powder we actually weigh out to get our final um, needed dosage. From there, um, we we bring in our chemicals. We barcode our chemicals as well, as well. So everything goes into inventory. They are put on very specific shelves. Um, we do separate what the United States Pharmacopeia designates as hazardous is in a separate room from a non-hazardous room. And that is 
um, again, coming up because of some federal regulations that the FDA is enforcing as of December of, of this year. However, the operating standards with OSHA actually implemented the majority of these standards um, several years ago. So the powders are received, they're inventoried, um, the pharmacist reviews a certificate of analysis, and then they go into the labs. The technicians who are highly trained, they actually have additional training um, above and beyond. They need to recognize what these powders do. They need to recognize and be trained on different techniques as to how to build capsules, actually how to mix the powders. Um, if you have a little pile of a, of a powder versus a bigger pile of a powder, how do you incorporate that systematically to make sure that there is a thorough, even mixing of that? Both of those powders are probably white. The majority of the active and inactive ingredients are. But we also have to make sure that not only are they mixed well, but even that, that their particle size is very similar. Because you could imagine if you had um, a container of sand and a container of rocks, that if you put them both into um, a, a glass jar, the rocks are going to take up quite a bit of volume quicker, and the sand is actually going to fill in around. So if we had all the pieces were sand, it would mean for a much easier and uniform mixture. And that's really important. Um, and that's really important to make sure that, again, we are, we're providing accurate dosing. So there's a wide variety of mixing techniques. Um, there's a wide variety of ways to weigh things out as well. So the powders are um, inventoried. We have a very specific formula, so it doesn't matter which of our technicians pull up that formula at any given time. They're all going to have the exact set of instruction um, from that. The, they will select their machinery because, again, on the formula, it tells them exactly what pieces of equipment they're going to need, how to mix it. So are they mixing it by hand? Are they mixing it in an electric mortar and pestle, which is a machine? Or are they mixing it in um, uh, a different machine that perhaps rotates and revolves even uh, differently under very high-frequency revolutions? From there, when they have a, a powder mixed and they, they put it in their capsule machine, how they then move the powders around. And then when those are finished, uh, finishing the capsules, and we take it a step further in that every batch of capsule that we make, we know the weight of the powders that go into it, the weight of the capsules themselves. So if we add all of that together, then we know how much that entire batch of capsules should weigh. So then we actually weigh them because we are conducting all of this in a powder containment hood. That means that all of the powders, if they are flying around, are not necessarily going to go into the nostrils or in the hair or on the clothing of our um, technicians or our pharmacists. So we want to keep them safe as well. They don't need to be taking all of these chemicals and, and um and medications home with them, they're to stay in the capsules. So we, we weigh everything out. We make sure that um, it's within a very specific parameter. Um, commercial manufacturers on brand name products are allowed to vary plus or minus 5%. Um, generic manufacturers are allowed to vary plus or minus 10%. And in our lab, we allow um, up to a 3% variability. And that's a very, very tight number. So we get a total weight of all of our capsules, and then we take a 10% um, uh, section uh, of that entire batch, and we weigh those individually to, again, see how well that technician is manually encapsulating. Those are really important parameters. Um, it, we also do this in a very specialized room. So the regulations, state, but more so on federal regulations, I mean, it is a completely enclosed room. It has very specialized airflow. We have, um, like I mentioned, powder containment hoods that are inspected um, at least on an annual basis to ensure that their um, suction or drawing pow uh, power, so the, the fan motor actually pulls air continually from the front to the back and then down into a HEPA filter. Um, and that removes the 
um, ability for the technician's exposure. So it, it really minimizes their their issues with um, uh, cross contaminating not only the the particles with other medications, but also decreases their exposure so that they don't have adverse effects from that. So there's a lot of quality control that goes into an actual compounding lab, um, and some of these some of these um, very specific rules may vary state to state, but we still have a very broad um, uh, federal mandate that we adhere to as well. Our pharmacy has elected voluntarily to also go through a national accreditation process by which we have even tighter quality control uh, procedures in doing that so that we can ensure that whether it is the first time, the ninth time, or the 90th time we are making that formula, that that formula is going to be even and that all of those patients receiving that medication are going to receive a near-perfect product. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do in, in our lab. Oh, that's amazing. And having seen myself behind the scenes, it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> I'm sure the interest, I mean, you must be interested to do what you're doing, but the novelty right. probably isn't the same for you as it is for me. I just find it really, really interesting. <laughs> so when somebody brings you a prescription for LDN, mm -hmm. what formula can they, they get it in from your pharmacy? As in formula, I mean what type, capsule, tablets, liquid, sublingual, cream. How would you dispense it? Compound it um, That's a great question. <laughs> and, you know, that that also goes back to personalized medicine because we believe that one size does not fit all, and that is really important. And in even specific lifestyles can change over time. For example, um, as in yourself, you travel. And so sometimes one dosage form may not be as convenient um, as another dosage form. So in our pharmacy, we provide low-dose naltrexone in a, in a variety of capsules. Um, we generally use a vegetable filler, so we're, we're not using fillers that are um, dairy-based or, or soy or anything like that. Um, we also provide a liquid form that's usually suspended in an oil, and we do that for a couple of different reasons. An oil suspension can be used sublingually, or they can swallow it. It also allows us to give it a little bit longer beyond use date. And that's very important for patient convenience because if the medication has to be made every 14 days because it's in an aqueous form, then that is not very convenient and that's going to decrease compliance and it, it will most likely end up in a medication failure because it's just too cumbersome. It's just, it's not easy for the patient to use. So they will stop using it. So an oil base is something that we do quite a bit of. We do make um, LDN in a cream as well, um, in several different cream forms. Some of them are, are more of a gel base. Um, we make transdermal LDN specifically for um, autism spectrum disorder. We, do, uh, we also make another type of cream base that might be used for um, lichen sclerosis, which can be in a wide variety of mucous membranes. And that seems to be very beneficial as well. Um, so we do capsules, we do liquids, in usually in an oil base. Um, and, oh, and we throw a little splash of flavor in there. So that's the other thing that makes it kind of fun um, is that uh, whether we're swallowing naltrexone or putting it under the tongue, sometimes it can be a little bit bitter. And that, again, will decrease compliance. That means that the patient outcome is not going to be the best. So whenever we can enhance that, we'll add a little bit of a, a flavor. So if we're using an oil-based vehicle, then we have to use an oil-based flavoring. So something like tangerine, lemon, lime, mint, cinnamon cream is actually the most common, the most uh, um, uh, called for. So that one is incredibly popular, really fun. So that does allow for the medication to be um, used in a little bit different 
application. Um, and then we also make uh, capsules and treats for dogs. Wow. That's kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that you must be using a natural flavoring. How long yes. does your liquid last? You, you said, you know, that in a, in a water base it was only 14 days. How long is the oil base? We can give a beyond use date expiration of about um, 90 to 180 days on an on a wow. oral oil-based wow. liquid. So it's very convenient, especially if somebody is slowly increasing their dose mm -hmm. um, until they get to their happy spot, whatever mm -hmm. that dose is for that individual, they're going to want to get just one container to, to kind of slowly increase that dose and, and find um, what their their magic dose is to help with all of their symptoms. Well, that certainly helps with the finances, doesn't it? If you can yeah. keep taking a little over a, a long period of time. What kind of yeah. oil is it that, that you use? Um, a lot of times we'll use a sweet almond oil base. Um, and for those that have uh, nut allergies, then we use olive oil. Mm -hmm. And olive oil has got a funny little flavor to itself. Um, we are currently looking at using an MCT oil as, as a base as well, as some people have asked um, about that, because clearly MCT oils have other anti-inflammatory properties, and so we're investigating that. So we're going to do a little little cooking in the kitchen and a little evaluation, and we'll send that off for testing. So that's where it still is very fun for us, and we always invite um, providers to come in uh, if they would like to see how our lab actually operates. Um, the door is always open, so we just uh, ask that they get a hold of us and let us know when they're coming so that we can make sure that we have um, enough people to show them around and give them a proper tour. Well, I'm sure they would find that of interest. I know I did. The oil that you said about trying, you used some letters. It meant mm -hmm. nothing to me. What kind of oil is that? Um, so the um, we use oils that have a USP monograph. So they are, they're not something you're going to go to the grocery store and just buy off the shelf. So these aren't these aren't cooking grade. These are actually medicine grade um, oils. So MCT is a medium chain triglyceride, um, usually derived from a coconut. Um, and then these are, like I said, medical grade products that we order from our chemical warehouses as well. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with the olive oil, same thing with the almond oil. So again, we're not just, you know, popping by the grocery to grab something off the shelf. It's, um, <laughs> it's much better than that. It's much more purified. And, and what we can get from that is, again, that certificate of analysis to make sure that there aren't any other impurities, aren't, there aren't any other types of oils in that. Perhaps there aren't any um, toxins or chemicals because sometimes we, we see things come through that have a, a touch of uh, um, icky chemical in it. And so that, that goes back. We don't we don't accept those um, because nobody wants nobody wants that. The whole purpose of using low dose naltrexone is to modulate and regulate the immune system and block those pain receptors. So it doesn't make sense to introduce something that we know is pro-inflammatory that we know is going to disrupt that process. Mm -hmm. We have discussed this many times on the radio show with different pharmacists. But what would you say to people who have been told it's okay to get the 50 milligram tablets and make the LDN themselves? What would your advice be? Well, although I really appreciate that they are trying to look at finances and, and um, to that I will say, you know, sometimes you can you think you're saving a little bit up front but you could actually be causing more damage and and there's a a wide variety of issues that play into that so first of all um the commercially available naltrexone is a tablet so it has binders and fillers so that entire tablet is not just naltrexone there's other pieces to that there usually are colorants there are inactive ingredients there's usually a, a powder coating on the outside as well um so in number one, the FDA allows that naltrexone generic tablet to be somewhere between 45 and 55 milligrams. So we don't really know 
um, we don't know commercially lot to lot exactly how strong or how close to the 50 milligram mark it is because of the allowance of that variability. So number one, you could be dealing with a subpotent or a super potent product. So are you really getting 50 or are you getting 45 or 55 milligrams? So that, that can be a little bit of a cause of concern as well. The other thing too is that um, just because it dissolves in water, again, where's that water coming from? So are you just turning on the tap? Um, are there heavy metals in the water? Are there, is there chlorine? Are, is there other chemicals that could potentially interrupt and in decrease the absorption of that naltrexone? So if you took a volume of water and you dissolve that naltrexone tablet, we don't really know if that liquid is then going to be stable for one day, three days, 14 days. Is it going in the refrigerator? Is it staying out on the counter? Um, because water coming out of the tap, even water coming out of a jug can still have impurities. It can still have chlorine. It can still have fluoride. It can still have um, um, lead and cadmium and arsenic and, and other impurities that we are trying to avoid. Uh, that's the whole point of using naltrexone. Um, so though I, I do appreciate that people have um, budgets that they need to be mindful of, we, we need to be really looking at the big picture and please allow those of us who have studied the science, that have the educational background, that really know the ins and outs, that are experts in not only looking at low-dose naltrexone um, or naltrexone active ingredient powder, um, let us compound it so that we can do the testing for you to ensure that you are getting the dose that you need at any point in your journey, but also that if you are getting, for example, a liquid, that it is going to be stable for you, not just on the day that you pick it up, but perhaps 30, 60, 90 days down the road. And I think that that is the whole point of medications is that we expect that when we take the prescription to the pharmacy, that that professional standing in front of us is going to have the wherewithal, the education, the, the knowledge, the scientific background to then give us the appropriate product to help us be well and be a much healthier person that we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say patient outcomes have been for you in your pharmacy using LDN? You know, um, again, this is a this is where I am amazed every day when I come to work is that um, to be able to be in a pharmacy. So I've I've been a pharmacist for 32 years, and I've owned my own store for eight now, and I've been compounding for, with LDN for um, about seven of those eight years, and every day becomes a new story, a new story of. Um, of hope, of regeneration, of renewed ho renewed health. Um, we compound medications for just about the entire spectrum of what LDN is helpful in. So whether we're dealing with pain, depression, um, autism, whether we're dealing with um, gastrointestinal upset, whether it's IBS, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, some of the autoimmune issues, Hashimoto's, Graves, um, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, postpartum or well, postpartum depression even, um, but even um, post-traumatic stress disorder. What I find very interesting is that the success rate with LDN is very high. Um, in most of the situations, we're looking at 75% success rates. Wow. And what we're, what we're dialing in on and those individuals who fill a prescription once or twice and then maybe go 6, 9, 12, 18 months without getting another prescription, what we're finding is that the communication ball has been dropped in that we're not hearing from the patient as to how we can possibly help them. Um, so we are reviewing our processes as to how to recapture that to see if maybe it's a dosage adjustment that we maybe need to go down on the dose, literally go down on the dose and help them renew that. 
Um, but when patients tell us that their doctor prescribed um, low-dose naltrexone at a, a sl slow increase dosing and that their magic dose was 3.25 milligrams, um, and that they were able to start with a liquid to find that happy dose, and now we're able to make them a capsule to meet their, their individual needs. And then when they tell us, well, you know, it was prescribed for Hashimoto. However, with that thyroiditis, I didn't realize how much anxiety I had, and now I'm so much calmer, and I can think much more clear. I didn't realize how much fogginess was running around in my brain. So it's not just the outcomes of doctor prescribed for one specific uh, reason and that one specific reason was taken care of. To me, this, the real success stories are when we're hearing about, and for lack of a better term, the small pieces that go around that because that improves overall quality of life. And that's where the dramatic impact really comes in. That is what is so exciting for me. I've been a pharmacist for a long time, but every day that I get to accept a new low-dose naltrexone prescription and really help somebody walk through the increase in dose to find their sweet spot, to be able to then find um, wellness, mm -hmm. that that is why I get up in the morning. Oh, wonderful. And when you were saying, you know, all the training you have done to, to be the pharmacist, mm -hmm. I always say to people when they're asking questions, go and speak to your pharmacist. You know, they're there. They've done the training. They know mm -hmm. there are so many people that give advice on LDM because they either take it or they know somebody who takes it or they have got some mm -hmm. connection to LDN in some way shape or form but they're not doctors mm -hmm. or pharmacists they've done no training and I feel we should try and get the best answers from the best people and mm -hmm. to, to go to a pharmacist who is willing to listen to you and your mm -hmm. questions and queries you know you are the person in my opinion to answer those medical questions because a medical question does need a medical professional to answer it correctly. Absolutely. And a lot of that comes with experience and training. And um, that's why I love going to the uh, LDN conference. I love listening to the radio shows. I live, love listening to the podcasts and things like that because to me, my pharmacist training at the University of Washington, um, and I graduated back in 1987, um, provided me a very good baseline to become a very good pharmacist. However, it's the, it's the lifelong learning. It's the zest for knowledge that not, not everyone is seeking. So everybody has a place. You know, there's just like in any, every profession, there are some pharmacists that love to count by fives and be behind the counter and answer general questions. And that's fantastic. I really appreciate the job that they do. But there's others of us that have taken on a specialty role, and this is truly what drives what we are able to do. Because we have become, those of us who compound LDN, um, have become experts in this field, a lot of times we hear snippets of stories and we're able to kind of put those pieces of the puzzle together to then um, learn from that and be able to carry on um, and answer other questions that might come up later. Um, so I can learn, I learn from every patient who comes into the pharmacy. I, I learn how to listen differently for this person versus another person. Somebody wants everything written out. Somebody else just wants me to verbally go over things. So it's really about finding an expert who you connect with and who is going to be able to follow you and take the time because I can share all of my experience, but if I don't listen to the patient and take a few minutes with that patient, I'm not really going to be able to help them mm -hmm. because I'm probably going to make a lot of assumptions and most of those assumptions are going to be false. <laughs> so, 
you know, it comes with time and experience and it comes with um, interacting with medical professionals who are experts in their diagnostic arenas. So learning from naturopaths, learning from uh, medical doctors, um, learning from um, even social workers and um, biochemists from all over the world and listening to their piece of the puzzle allows me to compound a better product each and every time, but even more so be able to connect with patients so that they can have better outcomes. That's, that's what all of it is about. Well, I'll have to stop you there, Michelle. You have given us so much to think about. It's been an amazing um half an hour thank you so much for having joined us today well thank you very much for having me linda and thank you for allowing me to share my passion and um, i really look forward to um, to speaking with you again thank you makers compounding pharmacy makes medications with you in mind a nationally pcab accredited pharmacy who take your specific needs into account with every prescription. Let their LDN experts walk with you on the road to wellness. Call 360-757-6677 or visit makerscompounding.com. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.